welcome everybody live, Facebook and YouTube. Thank you for joining us as well. And we want to tell you hello. And you can give in-house or online at amanacf.org. It's also a giving box in the foyer. So open up your Bibles to John 15. The title is Abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. There's a number of things I'd like to say about abiding in Christ. Um, and it may happen today and it may not. But let's just start with John 15, verse 1. Nice title slide there. Heather actually made that title slide today. Oh, yesterday she made that. And she, she was in the office doing some work here. And she, uh, she said, hey, what's your title? I said, well, I'll, it says Abiding in Christ. And she, and I, and she made a title slide. I said, wow, that's pretty good. Uh, so when Heather comes in the office, she can make a title slide. So we, I may be like, hey, uh, can you go to the office Saturday? I need uh, a title slide. Now, it's okay if we don't have a title slide. Do y'all believe the Holy Spirit can move without a title slide? Right? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, so it's, it's not a big deal. It's just, but it is appreciative when it's there. It's very nice. John 15, verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. And I, I, I read that yesterday. And I had a thought that I hadn't had before. Well, a, a number of thoughts. The first one is, obviously, he identifies himself as the I am. You know, he identifies himself as the I am. Jesus exists. He is. He doesn't need anything or anyone to be. He is. He be. He is, he be, he am. <laughs> the English language is very limited when it comes to the things of God. And, and, and we try, but we could say he be or he am, but he is. And he doesn't need us or anyone or anything to be. Uh, he, he, is, he is the expression of the Father. He needs, he needs, bless you, you are so blessed today. Uh, he, he, he needs the Father. He's the expression of the Father. He's, he's the very words of the Father. Now, now, now here, here we go. Wow, here we go. He's the words of the Father. And we live on the word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. We live on every word that proceedeth from the mouth of the Father, and Jesus is the word of the Father. We live on Christ. And we need nothing or no one to be. Just as Christ needs nothing or no one to be. For the I am of him can become aware within us by Christ alone. I was telling my children there are accounts of people in eastern countries who were, you know, decades ago and even now, who were locked up underground in a cell without sunlight for years. And share, share the reality of the awareness of Christ in a way they had never experienced before. For it is the nothingness of man that provides so much space for the awareness of Christ, for the I am, for the existence, the awareness of him in the absence of us. For we need nothing but Christ. I am the vine. 
true vine. It is Christ. That's actually the verse I was talking about. For those online, there's a someone's phone started saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that's exactly what we just said. Jesus is the expression of the Father. And we live on the every word that proceeds from him. That is what we live on. And it is the nothingness that we embrace of self. It is the nothingness that we embrace of self that provides the space for the realities of his life to become aware of that. Now, I don't know if you're understanding that. I don't know. But it's crystal clear to me. It's as simple as Easy arithmetic. It's as simple as two plus two. It's so crystal clear. It's so crystal clear. It is. It, 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 I don't even need scripture to justify it. It is so understood. It is so crystal clear. We could spend hours, possibly days, on lavishing ourselves on scriptures that justify and support this. But when one comes to the understanding and has been taught by Christ, when you come to the understanding of this, it is as simple, it is as clear as the Caribbean, it is, you can see straight through, it's so clear, it's simple. It's Christ. But until, until the believer gives up all hope, Himself, he cannot see this. He cannot. Who is this that darkens the counsel of God? He told Job. Who is this that darkens my counsel? Who is this that makes my counsel unclear? Who is this that muddies up the waters with dust? Until we give up on self, it will always be muddy. And the pearl does not go to those who play in the mud. The treasure is hidden from the learned and the wise and revealed to little children. See, it's the little children who give up on self have no temptation to trust and, and rely on self. Little children don't even know that they one day will have to become independent in life. They don't even consider it. They don't even consider it. They don't even worry about it. That one day they'll have to go to work and provide. They don't even, they don't even think about that. They don't even know that's real. They don't really even believe they're ever going to be anything but children. They don't concern themselves. They don't concern themselves with self. They concern themselves with what mom and dad can do for them. And so it is with the believer. He cannot concern himself with self concerning the things of God. You can concern yourself with self concerning the things of this world. You want to be a good chess player? Study it. Practice it. You have to. You want to have a nice looking yard? Sweat. Mow your lawn at 9.30 at night and sweat. It's fine. You have to. The things of this world require self. And even in that, God wants to play a part. But don't confuse the approach to this world with the approach of his spiritual world. Don't confuse the two. For he does not need flesh to prosper his world. So he is the true vine. And I read in Isaiah somewhere that he says, I will bring the vine 
out of Egypt. He was talking, I always read that and thought, Israel came out, the Hebrew people came out of Egypt. He delivered them in Moses' day. He says, I'll bring this vine out of Egypt and I will plant it in Israel and Jacob and it will bear fruit and be healthy. And then it hit me. Jesus, as an infant, was moved to Egypt. The Old Testament prophesied of him coming out of Egypt. Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt. I thought, oh, that's what that scripture is really talking about, is the true vine was taken out of Egypt, brought to Jacob, and he says, my father's the gardener, and we're going to bear some fruit here. We're going to bear some fruit here. Now, I want to, I want to go, I want to go to verse 2. And I want to show you something that has been revealed to me. And I want you to see the compassion of Christ. Guys, I have the same notes I had last week. And, that, and I guess we, we may have the same notes next week. I'm not moving till he moves. Now, I'm not. And he says, this is what Jesus says about the Father. And watch this. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes or cleans so that it would be even more fruitful. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always read that verse as ju- judgment. Judgment. That he cuts off the branch that does not bear fruit. I, 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 mean, I could not help but to read it as that, as he's... You know, the, the believer that's not bearing fruit, he's going to cut off. He's going to remove them. But boy, there's a much more adequate teaching here. And I want you to hear it. You see, he says, Yeah, there it is. It's on that screen, too. Listen carefully. He cuts off every branch. Listen, listen, listen. In me. He's talking about believers. Now, listen to me. This is what I don't think he's saying. I don't think he's saying there are some believers in me that are going to get cut off, and there are other believers in me that are going to bear much fruit. Not what he's saying. The two descriptions are in you. They're both in you. Listen to me. Are you in him? There's a part of you, if you're in him, that he wants to cut off. There is a part of you Flesh, self, Romans 7, there is nothing good that lives in me that is in my sinful nature. Paul, if then by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, then you will live. How do you put to death the misdeeds of the body? By the Spirit. You turn to Christ. And by the Spirit, the misdeeds of the body get put off. And the greatest misdeed of the body is not even an action. It's a belief system. It's a belief system that puts confidence in self concerning the things of God. Must be cut off. 
here's the good news. He says, in me, the Father will cut it off. You want a scripture validation? Deuteronomy 6 or 30 or 36. Deuteronomy. It, it is written. It is written. For the Lord your God will circumcise your heart so that you might love him with all, all your heart, <coughs> mind, soul, and strength. For the Lord your God will cut away flesh in your heart. That's what he's saying. Chapter 30, verse 6. For the Lord your God will cut away. Read, read the screen. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. The Lord your God in Christ will cut away the flesh in your soul concerning the things of God so that you might love him. How many are taught? How many, are, how many have flipped that backwards and said, love God, love God so that your heart will be circumcised. Love God so that Let God, let God, let God, let God cut away the flesh so that you might love God. <coughs> Which, by the way, is the greatest commandment. So if the greatest commandment is only obeyed when God works in the heart, how can any other command be obeyed? How can any other command be obeyed? If the greatest command can only be obeyed when God cuts away flesh in the heart, when God does what Jesus said he would do in the gardener of John 15, verse 2. That branch is in you. That branch will accompany you to the day you die. If we operate from that branch, we will have a counterfeit Christ. That's the lukewarm branch. That's the branch that's lukewarm. That's the branch that says, look at the works of God. They're God's works, and they're really coming from a fruitless branch of flesh. He's saying that's lukewarm. That profanes my holy name. That tells a world that knows nothing about me that the works of God are limited to the greatness of flesh. Jesus would say, I would rather you be cold. I would rather you not profess anything about God than to profess a counterfeit one. There's nothing new under the sun, guys. Just because we call it God doesn't mean it is God. Moses goes up the mountain. Aaron fashions a golden calf and says, this is Yahweh who delivered us from Egypt said all the right words. Had the calf not been there, it would have been perfect. Had they just said, Yahweh God delivered us from Egypt, it would have been perfect. But what made it imperfect is that they formed and fashioned something with human hands and called that Yahweh God. Nothing new. We just don't form calves because we were taught that was wrong, and it is. So we find a different way to do it. The works of human hands, calling it the works of Christ, is a profaning of the name of God. That's the branch he wants to cut off. That's the branch he says would, that will bear no fruit. That's the branch that he removes, that the gardener removes, that the father removes. And too few times the believer will turn to him for the removal of that branch because he's living in shame about his unproduction, his unproductivity, his ineffectiveness, 
his inefficiency concerning the things of God, the believer lives in shame and guilt, and God is saying, I'm tired of that. I'm slow to anger. I'm abounding in love. I actually think he loves your failure because he's hoping every time you fail to represent him from that branch, from the branch of flesh, to represent him with good intention. I think he wants you to embrace your failure and to say, you know what? I can't do it, and unless you do it, it is not going to be done. Unless you do it, it's not going to happen. Now I'm fully surrendered in self, and now and only now can I fully turn to Christ. If I kind of surrender to self, I can kind of turn to Christ. I can only turn to Christ in as much as I've surrendered on self. I'm calling it self, but I often call it flesh. For it is your nature. It is a nature that you possess that must be cut off. There are many pictures of this throughout Scripture. In the woman were two babies, and they warred against each other. Jacob and Esau and Rebecca. Am I right? Rebecca. Fact check me, brother. In Rebecca, there were two boys Jacob, Esau. They were warring. They were warring to be born first because the firstborn, the firstborn, so it was understood, would represent the seed that the Messiah would come through. And the one born first did not represent the Messiah. Just as inside Rebecca, there was a war between two mindsets. Inside the believer, there were two mindsets, and this is what's happening. But watch now. The part of you that was born first, flesh, wants to represent the Messiah. And God says, it will not. You want to talk about predestination. It is predestined that the one born first will not represent Christ, but the one born second will. That's predestined. And let me tell you this. It is the part of you that was born second, spiritual birth, that must represent Christ. It is the one, the person of you that was born first, self or flesh, born first, that must be yielded to the Father to cut away, to circumcise the heart of that one, to cut it away because it cannot bear fruit. The two sons of Abraham, the first two. Y'all know he had a bunch more kids, huh, later with Keturah? It was like God was just showing off. Like, <laughs> <he's> like <laughs> He's like, you're 90-something years old. Everybody thinks that's awesome. Let's give it another 20 years. I'll give you six more. Because I could do anything. What about his two sons? God says, you're going to have a child with Sarah. And he's going to represent the Messiah. And it didn't happen. And it didn't happen. And it didn't happen. So with human reasoning, with human reasoning and human effort, he turns to a woman of flesh, Hagar, with the attempt to bring birth to the Messiah. Christian, I'm supposed to see the life of Christ formed in me. It's not happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. So with human reasoning and with human effort, I'll turn to flesh to try to bring forth the works of Christ. And God is so compassionate and loving that he says he doesn't give up on Abraham. He corrects him. 
allows Abraham and his family to become very frustrated, which is the result of leaning on flesh. It will always lead to frustration. Always. It is a fruitless frustration of the flesh. F cubed. Fruitless frustration of flesh. Instead of the spirit forming the realities of Christ, we have the fruitless frustration of flesh forcing a counterfeit Christ. What happened? Abraham turns back to God and stays with the woman who cannot produce a child in the flesh that could only produce a child if the spirit acts. If God acts... It will happen. If God does not act, it will not happen. I will not form the Christ seed unless God acts. That's what Abraham had to come to. And he's the father of our faith. And he's who we should be replicating. Unless God acts, Christ will not be formed. And, and I was commissioned by God to form Christ through Sarah. I was commanded, and yet I cannot do it unless God does it. Just like you were commanded to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and you cannot do it unless he circumcises the heart, Deuteronomy 36. So you cannot form Christ unless God acts. You cannot bring forth to the fruit of the Spirit unless God acts. You cannot fulfill the Great Commission unless God acts. You cannot even rid yourself of sin unless God acts. And God is only going to act in as much as you turn to him, and you're only going to turn to him in as much as you turn from self, and you're only going to turn from self in as much as you give up on self. And you're only going to give up on self in as much as you become convinced or believe. In as much as you believe in Christ, you should believe in the ineffectiveness of self. Amen. In fact, I think one prefaces the other. We must give up on self, before we can ever even consider Christ. And by the way, the fruit of the flesh was Ishmael. Just watch the news. Just watch the news. Now, you want to know what the fruit of that flesh was? Ishmael. He harassed and taunted Isaac. You know what Paul said? He said, it's figurative, guys. Galatians 4. Jaden did an incredible teaching Wednesday night. Covered a lot of this. Paul said, it is the same today. That's what he said. He said, it is the same today. You see? What is born of the flesh is going to harass what is born of the spirit. Both of these boys are represented in the believer. The believer has the Ishmael in him, flesh, and he has him, spirit. And the flesh part of himself is going to harass the spirit part of himself. It's going to say, well, you're being irresponsible. Well, you're being lazy. You should do something for God. You can't tell me you don't have these thoughts. You can't tell me. I know you've had these thoughts because some of you have warred against me for a teaching this way. So I know you have these thoughts. I have these thoughts. Do something for God. Where's Christ? Harassment of Ishmael, the harassment of the flesh, it is the same today. We need to go back to Abraham, and we need to do what Abraham did and say, you know what? If God doesn't form Christ, Christ is not being formed. What if Mary, what if Mary got tired of waiting on the birth of Christ and tried to do that a little quicker. 
we'd have a deformed, defective Christ. He certainly would not have been unblemished, Lamb of God. No one would do that. But just as an example, if Mary had not waited on the appointed time of the pregnancy or the birthing of Christ, you would have had a forcing, you would have had a defect, right? It's the same today. Let the birthing of Christ in your life be formed at its appointed time, which God has appointed before time began. He who was found abiding and waiting will see the realities of the life and birthing of Christ, the glorious appearing of Christ in and through him over and over again. There's so much I want to tell you. There's so much I want to tell you. How do I ever... I, I, I look at my notes. I mean, almost none of it. He will remove that branch. He'll remove the Ishmael in you. He'll remove the Esau in you. He'll remove the flesh in you. He'll remove the branch part of you that can bear no fruit. He'll, he'll remove it. He will circumcise. Well, his circumcision is cutting away of the flesh. He will cut away of the flesh in your heart. Gosh. When you feel guilt and shame, what you're saying is, I'm disappointed because I should be able to do better. And you're missing it. Totally missing it. No, you can't do better. You can't. No, you can't. There are some obvious things you can abstain from. Probably shouldn't slap your neighbor when they're too loud or something. <laughs> you can probably, you, you have probably been graced in advance to avoid some things. Yeah, watch out, Miss Anita. Watch out right there. The guy in the green shirt, he has a temper. <laughs> Guys, when it comes to the things of God, don't waste another year of your life missing. God, because you're trying to pull off, turn to him. That's the flesh part. Verse 2, that's the flesh part. He cuts away every branch. I'm telling you both, I'm telling you both of these branches are in you, believer. They're both in you. A tree. A tree has branches that Produce fruit and branches that don't. And you cut away the ones that don't. But you're not condemning the tree. You're not condemning the tree. He's not condemning the believer. He's saying there's a part of the believer that i got to cut away. Let me. Quit trying to produce fruit there. And there's another branch in you. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes or he cleans so that it will be even more fruitful. He's saying, I cut away a part of you and I fertilize another part of you. Remain in me. I, I, my nourishing sap will do its work if you remain in me. Both of these branches, he says, in me. They're in me. He cuts off every branch in me. He's saying, believer, you're in me, and you have a branch that needs to be cut off. 
we're only scratching the surface. I mean, we could talk about Ishmael. We could talk about Esau. We could talk about self. We could talk about the fruitless branch. We could talk about the Egyptian magician's staffs trying to replicate what Moses' staff did. It's just it's a counterfeit. We, 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 can, we can go on and on. We can give many examples. We can do this all day long. It would never end. One must ask, why is this so thoroughly? Why is this so thoroughly throughout Scripture? Well, I think you know the answer. I think God would say, what part of trusting Christ do you want me to stop lavishing? What part of giving up on self do you want me to not emphasize? If, uh, if only we could grasp the reason. If only we could grasp the reason why God wants us to let him do this. If only you knew. You see, when he says, when he says that I will circumcise your heart so that you will love me, what he's really saying is this. When you let me remove the fruitlessness of self, then you're making room for me to work in you. And when I work in you, you experience me. And when you experience me, there's only one response. You're going to love me. He's pretty confident, by the way. He's pretty sure of himself. And it ain't a bad thing. He's saying, I know I'm good. He's saying, I'm real good. And I already know, when you experience me, you're going to love what I have to offer. Think about like a great chef who walks into, you know, into a fast food place and and says, y'all think that's good? He says, I know I'm good. Just think of your favorite food and your favorite chef. He come in your house and says, what's that in that bag you eating? He says, put that away. He might even grab it and put it away for you and say, let me, let me, let me tell you something. I know I'm good. I already know. When I put before you what I, what I cook, I already know you're going to love it. Go a step further. Let's get a chef that knows everything about you. Knows everything about you. Knows your diet. Knows what you love knows what you medically can't have and can have and knows your favorite stuff and says, ha, ha, now I really know what I make for you. You're going to love. You see, God knows. He's saying, when I work through you, I know you're going to love me. Everybody's been trained. God wants us to stop sinning because it's ugly and it's hateful and he doesn't like sin. Well, that's true. That's not the point. Even an unspiritual mind can understand that. I mean, it's obvious. I mean, every generation of humanity, every generation of humanity, every, every tribe, every island person has always gotten upset when a man slept with his wife. Like, adultery has never been a good thing. Like, this is obvious. You don't really think that's the fullness of why God doesn't want you to sin. That's obvious. God wants to remove the flesh part for, one, for, for two reasons. And I'm going to tell you the primary reason. It's because when, when the flesh part is removed by him, there's space for the believer to experience him. 
And when the believer experiences him, primary reason, the believer cannot help but to love him. You never have to try to love God. Be free. Be free of that. You're set free. You're set free. You don't have to try to love God. You don't have to try to love God. My children never had to try to love me. As they get older, they'll have to try to love me. But their natural instinct was to love me. And even more, mama. You don't have to try to love God. Let God cut away the flesh. Let God prune you and produce fruit in you. Turn to him. And you, by nature, will love him. And that's all he wants. Because remember, that's what was broken in the garden. It was one thing and one thing only. It wasn't about heaven and hell. And, it was, and all that's real. All that's real and all that's true. But it's not the primary thing. It's not what it's about. The only thing it was about was relationship with God. That's what was broken. It was relationship with God. Because man now knew more information that he could lean on instead of leaning on God. It was all about relationships. It's all he wants. He doesn't want you to sin because he wants relationship. And number two, when the believer becomes one with God in the sense that God is having his way through him, the world witnesses Christ in you. The world comes convinced that he came. It's the unity with God. Look at Isaiah. See, that's why I needed my phone, Mom. Isaiah 51. This is the call of the manna. When God works through the believer, the believer is one with him. Jesus prayed for the believer. I never look over here. Hey, you guys are part of this too. <laughs> when Jesus prayed for the believer in John 17, he prayed that they might become one, Father, as we are one. Now, he was not praying that you would become the Messiah. He was saying, Father, in the way that you live and work through me, that's the unity that I want them to have. I want that of which, Father, that of which you live and work through me, I want to live and work through them. See, I will take from what is the Father and give it to you, he said. That's what he's talking about. When Christ works through the believer, it is a direct result of the Father working through Christ, who in turn is now working through the believer, and the believer has now become one with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's <coughs> perfection. If only we'd stay there, we would always be perfect. And when we are there, we are always perfect, but we are imperfect at remaining there. That's the, when you see one, that's what we're talking about. When you see one, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about being one with him because he's fully having his way in us. Now, Kim, help me close. Read this verse. Isaiah 51, verse 1. Read this verse with me. Let me go there. This is the call of a manna. I call this the call of a manna. Listen to me. Listen to me. Pastor Taylor, you did a great teaching that time on on the the uh, is it called the Shema? He says, "Hear, O Israel, listen." Listen to me. Listen to me. You who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord, 
listen to me, he's saying. You want to seek righteousness? You want to seek the Lord? Listen to me. Watch. Listen and look. Look. Watch. Jesus says, watch. Paul says, watch for the glorious appearing of the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Now watch. We talked about Abraham. Watch. Listen for God. Look to God and consider Abraham your father and to Sarah who gave you birth. When I called him, he was but one. Now he says, and I blessed him and made him many. When he says many, he's referring to numerical descendants. You can think great commission. But when he says one, he's not talking about one person. Because Abraham, when he was called, he had Sarah with him. He had his nephew Lot with him. They had not been separated. Go back and look at it. When he called Abraham initially, he was not one in the sense of by himself. He was one in the sense that he was one with God. He was watching for God. He was listening for God. He wanted God to fully have his way with him. He was one. And the result of being one with him and that he's having his way is that it results in many. The world begins to see Christ. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all of her ruins. I would say this, embrace, embrace the lifeless ruins of your flesh. Embrace it. Own it. Identify it. Become convinced of it. My flesh, concerning the things of God, is nothing but a lifeless ruin. Because that is the place Christ shows up at. He says that he will surely comfort that place. Christian lives in shame because of that. He's saying, no, look to me for my comfort because of that. And this is what he says. He will make her deserts like Eden. Embrace the desert of your flesh. Accept that there is no pool of water offered from your flesh. There is no lush garden offered from your flesh. No, no, no. Your flesh, he wants to cut away like a branch that cannot bear fruit. Embrace that your flesh has no lush garden and your flesh has no pool of water to offer. It is like the desert. You know what it's like? It's like the desert of sin. That too was pictured in advance. But he will go to that place and he will manifest the Garden of Eden. Until we offer him a desert, he will not produce Eden. Her wastelands, oh, embrace the wasteland of your flesh. Embrace the fact that you cannot produce a lush garden from your flesh and that Christ must do it. Embrace it. Own it. Be convinced of it. But that wasteland is like the garden of the Lord. How else would they know it's God? Joy and gladness will be found in her. 
thanksgiving and the sound of singing. That's the result. You know what it says later? It says, I love this, gladness and joy will overtake them. In the way that a desert has overtaken your flesh concerning the things of God, so gladness and joy and lush gardens of God and fruit will overtake, it will overtake you. Believer, you will laugh again. Believer, you will hold your head high again. He will enable you to hold your head high. Believer, you will become confident again. Believer, you will be filled with peace again. But not until you surrender in your efforts for God. He will not let you confuse your efforts with His. This is the desire of God, that you would experience Him in this way, that you would know Him, and relationship would be back. That you would no longer only hope to go to heaven one day to experience God, but that you would become convinced that the experience of God is here also. work of Christ, the fruit of Christ, the character of Christ, the teaching of Christ. He wants to form these things, the holiness of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, teach us to abide in you. Teach us to remain. Remaining means to be still. Remaining means I'm not moving from my post, from my position. Remaining means I'm not doing anything. I'm waiting. I'm watching. That's abiding. First John 2 tells us that Jesus, that the anointing abides in us, meaning he's not moving, he's not working, he's not going until the believer joins him in the death of Christ or in the abiding of Christ until the believer joins him in his abiding. Only then will he begin to move and to live and to have his way. Until then, he merely and simply and faithfully abides in us. It sounds so good that he abides in us, but in a way, in a way, it's only the beginning of what he wants to do. His abiding in us is only the posture it's not what his desire is. He desires to live and to work and to move in us. He doesn't desire to abide in us. He desires to live, move, work, and have his way in us. But he will only abide in us so as to never leave us or forsake us. He will only abide in us until we abide in him. And then he will live and move and have his way. Oh, Lord, teach us to abide in you. Amen. Bless you guys. Love you.